I feel like the most perfect capstone to our day together. I know it's been a day full of dynamic and interesting conversations, but I am so pleased and honored to introduce Jeremy Tiang as our keynote speaker. Uh, Jeremy Tiang is a novelist, playwright, and cinephone translator. Recent translations include Liu Chiwu's The Wedding Party, which was shortlisted for the National Translation Award, as well as novels by Zhang Yuren, Sheng Chuan Tao, Lo Yichin, Yang Ge, and Yang Pui Ngong. Their novel, State of Emergency, won the Singapore Literature Prize in 2018. Earlier this year, they were Princeton University translator in residence and served on the jury of the International Booker Prize. Originally from Singapore, they live in Flushing, Queens. Welcome, Jeremy Tiang. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks to Kat for organizing this amazing day and to the Phillips Collection for having us. Um, thank you to all the panelists for some brilliant conversations. I feel nourished and provoked and slightly hysterical, a bit like I look in the picture, which is a great way to go into a talk, um, which I've called Why We Translate, What We Translate. Um, a bit Carver-esque, but this is actually, and I said it to him, see if he would recognize it, an Anton Her quote. In fact, it is a quote from an Anton Her tweet, the best kind of tweet. Um, I'm citing an entire thread here, um, which I'm going to read out because it seems like the perfect starting point. Anton says, wondering whether the Amanda Gorman translator controversy shows the need for translators to really think through why we translate what we translate. Example, I've been asked why, as a cis man, I've taken on women authors. These are valid questions and we need to have answers ready. Not because we'll get canceled otherwise, like that's a thing, but because it's an opportunity to think about the larger issues in translation. Even if the answer is, I just wanted the money, or I just wanted the opportunity, think instead of sliding into the banality of, of evil. Lots of things about being an artist or a translator is the ineffable aspect of it, how we somehow can't put our motivations into words. But I think we can put a lot of these thoughts into words. We owe it to the communities we serve. We owe it to the source text and our authors. And so in a way, this talk is a response to Anton's challenge. What happens if we take this opportunity to think about the larger issues in translation, if we take a step back to look at the big picture, something that doesn't happen as often as I would like to see it? Because to start with, translators are often in a defensive position. As Emily Apter says in her thesis on translation, the translation zone is a war zone and translators often feel embattled. As we heard in the panel of advocacy, there's so much that needs to be changed in the field of translation, not in the field itself, but in the way translators and translation get treated by the wider industry, by our working conditions, by the commercialization of art in this country and so forth. Jhumpa Lahiri says in her book, Translating Myself and Others, now that I have become a translator, in addition to remaining a writer, I am struck by how many people regard what I am doing as secondary and thus creatively inferior in nature. Translation, it seems, is considered imitative as opposed to imaginative. To which all I can say is join the club, Jumper, because that is indeed how I experience the way I'm treated in certain quarters of the literary world, as if I am merely responsive as a translator, as if I have no agency of my own. Um, in the other, uh, otherwise excellent, The Fall of Language in the Age of English by Minae Mizumura, translated by Mari Yoshihara and Juliet Winters Carpenter, we have this description of a group of scholars. They were basically translators, transmitters, not creators of knowledge. 
And I wonder what that means, to think of myself as a transmitter, not a creator. Does language and knowledge just pass through me unaffected? Am I just clear glass, hence invisible, like translators are supposed to be? And this is why, while I do have sympathy with the insistence that translation is writing, or sometimes translation is a specialized form of writing, translation is a form of writing with particular constraints, I feel like this can be an unhelpful way of framing what it is we do, because it is all too easy to point out the ways in which translation differs from writing, by which I mean writing that begins with the blank page. And here is where I suggest that perhaps, as translators, we have more in common with other artists who also do not start with the blank page. And the analogy I always reach for here is performers. This comes partly from my own background. I was once an actor, to be clear, a spectacularly unsuccessful actor. <laughs> but I thought what I did was creative. And I think most people would agree that artists, actors are artists even though we just say the lines that are given to us. Now here's, um, I'll start with a framing that I don't agree with from Eliot Weinberger in his essay, Anonymous Sources. He says, the translator as translator is not a fully formed human being. The translator in the familiar analogy is an actor playing the role of the author. Um, but all this tells me is that Elliot Weinberger doesn't understand what actors do or possibly doesn't understand analogies. <laughs> and I am no more playing the role of the author than an actor who is cast in the role of Hamlet is playing Shakespeare. A much better way of framing the issue comes from the late Carol Meyer's essay, Translation as Performance. The image of the translator as actor appealed to me because it called to mind movement and sound. I've always experienced translation and the representation that takes place on paper as a dynamic understanding of a text. And thus I could easily imagine myself in action on stage presenting my version of a poem by Octavio Armand, Octavio Armand being the Cuban poet she translated. And this is much closer to the way I experience translation as a version of performance, as a type of interpretation of someone else's text. She also points out how performance, like translation, can be ephemeral. It might be captured for posterity, or it might evaporate in the moment and just before the present. No one would dispute that actors are artists. No one would dispute that concert pianists are artists, even though, you know, if we talked about pianists the way we talk about translators, we'd say all they do is press the keys according to the order that someone else has written. But we don't do that. We understand that there is a level of interpretation and that's where the art lies. But we don't tend as a society to think about translators in this way. In a highly unscientific survey, I googled the names of various prominent actors and musicians along with the phrase body of work. And this brought up many results. We talk about Meryl Streep's body of work, i.e. all the film roles she has taken. We consider those as a body of work, even though she didn't initiate many of these parts. She didn't write the roles. She didn't direct the films. She was cast in them, and presumably, because she's Meryl Streep, made a choice to take on these roles. And we see that as a form of curation. But if you Google, for example, Jennifer Croft, body of work, Deborah Smith, body of work, the results refer to the body of work by one of the authors that these translators have worked on. But really, almost never, or really never that I have found by the translator themselves, and yet these translators absolutely do have a body of work. You can look at everything they've translated and see how conscious artistic choices have been made, how you can put these translations next to each other and they are in conversation. 
and the whole thing adds up to a wider artistic project. These are people who have taken a step back and thought about translation in a deeper, big picture way. My own so-called body of work has pushed against the dominance of mainland China in the Sinophone space. I've sought out work from Taiwan, from Singapore, from Malaysia, and I found it's actually helped when I'm making choices not to ask, do I want to translate this? Though, of course, that comes into question. I look at a book, is this interesting to me? Do I want to translate it? But it is clarifying to also ask, do I want to add this book to my body of work? And when you think of it in those terms, the stakes become higher, the translation means more, and you see it in conversation with, or I see it in conversation with other things I've done. Now, when I have seen or initiated this conversation in other spaces, by which I mean social media, where these conversations do happen, there tends to be a chorus of voices saying, oh, but we don't have the luxury of picking and choosing. Oh, we don't have that kind of power. Oh, that's impractical. And look, I used to be an actor, and actors understand that, you know, we exist on a spectrum from Meryl Streep, who can pick and choose her projects, to, well, me, whose highest paid ever acting job was a Burger King commercial. True story. And yet, no one would say, oh, most of us don't get our name on the posters, so Meryl Streep shouldn't have her name on the poster. Most of us don't get to pick and choose our projects, so we shouldn't talk about Meryl Streep's body of work. We understand that this can be aspirational, this can be something we would like to see happen, and we can at least speak it into being so that we can move however incrementally towards it. And to be absolutely clear, I want to clarify that I absolutely do not mean that this is a call to only translate it high-minded, esoteric, experimental, literary fiction. Merrill, after all, had no qualms about making not one but two Mamma Mia films. <laughs> As Anton says, whatever it is your reasons might be for taking a particular job on, it is important that you do at least consider why this is happening and if you do still want to go ahead without judgment, but at least to have that moment of examination. Yet there is in the translation world a determination in certain courses to say, oh no, no, I don't need that. No, don't rock the boat, don't ask for too much. No, no, I don't really need my name on the cover. And part of this is what Alice Whitmore identifies in her essay, Anonym. The fact that, I've omitted some names here, the fact that some white male translators are capable of minimizing their own work with such lucidity and authority suggests to me that these are people who have never had their work minimized for them. So it comes as no surprise that it is primarily women translators, queer translators, and translators of color who are leading this newest iteration of the pro-translation movement. An essay, incidentally, that so angered Elliot Weinberger that he responded with the delightfully bonkers assertion that, and I quote, the translation of most of the high profile or prestigious books has always been assigned to women or gay men. <laughs> but apart from not needing um, not having their work minimized, I think there is also an attraction to the idea that translators are powerless because it is a way of disclaiming responsibility. What I think of as the I'm just following orders school of literary translation. After all, if we are so powerless that we can affect nothing, then what is the point of thinking deeply about what we do? But I would like to recall what Madhu said earlier in the day it's not up to anyone to solve the problem, but it is up to all of us to ask, what can I do? And this applies to everything, how we translate, what choices we make, which are so often framed as just questions of aesthetics or craft, but that can only be a part of it. Where do we position ourselves in all of this? So if we accept, 
as I'm positing that translators are creative artists, does that mean we forfeit the right to a living wage? Um, leading question, no, of course not. Um, and here I'm going to quote Alex Zucker in an interview in Hopscotch magazine. I'd like to see more translators think of themselves as workers and of their work as labor, not only as art, which unfortunately in our society too often carries with it the expectation that it will be unpaid. Honestly, to insist on translation only as a labor of love without acknowledging that it is also a profession is a hindrance to translators' efforts to be paid fairly. And this is, I think, another element lying behind the reluctance to claim this power. If we take up the space we should occupy as artists, I think there is a fear that what we do becomes a labor of love rather than a labor of labor that deserves compensation. But we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can fight to be treated as artists and fight for better working conditions because artists too are workers. So we can be artists, we can fight for better working conditions and we can push for a more expansive vision of what we do. In her book, Not Like a Native Speaker, Ray Chow says, I am not adhering strictly to the common definition of the translator as a professional word worker who carries meanings from one language into another. Instead, I would like to explore translation and translator by way of something approximate, namely the notion of an arbiter of values as embedded in disparate cultural literacies or systems. In a similar but slightly more mercenary vein, William Marling says in his book, Gatekeepers, gatekeepers acquire, develop, and then exploit a double cultural competence, a mastery of two sets of cultural information, in the use of which they become aware of cross-cultural discrepancies. This discrepant awareness alerts them to a quality of one culture or literature that could be valued in a second culture or language. Translators are among the most important gatekeepers. Now, I know translators don't tend to think of ourselves as gatekeepers. And we are at the same time subject to gatekeepers. I certainly don't feel like a gatekeeper when I'm writing my little emails to publishers saying, please, sir, would you look at my sample? But at the same time, I think about many of the books that I have advocated for that have been published, particularly the texts from outside mainland China, the books from Taiwan or Singapore or Malaysia that no one was looking at and that got published because, well, I went knocking on enough doors until I found someone who shared my vision, but that would not have been on the radar of book scouts or agents or anyone who might have taken notice. So in a way, that is a gatekeeping function to what I, to what many of us do. But that is because we take on so many roles. And I think that is a type of conflation that happens where my work effectively as a book scout or agent becomes entangled with my work as a translator. And so people think of me as a translator when they say, oh, you've done so much for, for example, Taiwanese literature. And I, I don't want to be a tireless advocate of Taiwanese literature. I don't want to be a tireless advocate of anything. I'm actually quite tired. I'm an artist. I want to make art. And, and this is a really difficult position to be in because when I'm advocating for a book, when I'm pushing, pitching, selling a book, I'm expected to talk about the qualities of the book and how important it is and how great the author is. And if I were to say the truth, which is, I love this author, I want to collaborate with them. I think this book would be creatively challenging, artistically fun to work on. This book deals with an area that I want to explore more, and so I want to translate it. These would be seen as deeply odd things to say for a translator, and not particularly good arguments for a publisher to take on the book. But again, if Michelle Yeoh were to say, I loved this part, so I fought for it, 
I pushed for this film to be made so I could play that role. That would be a good and normal way for an actor to talk. So why are translators not given that kind of leeway to be artists? And I, I say we just claim that space until the rest of society catches up. In some quarters of translation studies, we do get views like Maria Timoshko's in her introduction to translation resistance activism. Expansions in translation studies trace a trajectory away from technical questions about how to translate, per se, towards larger ethical and political perspectives on the activity of translating, on the functions of translation products in relation to power, and on the agency of translators implicit in many of these discourses are ideological questions. And this was really interesting to me when I came across it, because I do not think the vast majority of literary translators think of their work in this way, within the framework that some quarters of translation studies have placed upon it. And I, I don't want to tell anyone what to think. I'm not going to say, well, maybe we should think like this, but I am going to say, just imagine what might be possible if more of us did think like this, ideologically, big picture of ourselves as activists. A writer whose radical imagination I can only aspire to, Sawaka Nakayasu, says in her pamphlet, Say Translation is Art, Say what does queer liberation look like if it chooses not gay marriage but alternative structures of human relationships. Say instead of book into translated book, say book into alternative structures of literature via translation, alternative structures of literature via translation. And that's something I hold to myself because, you know, as a queer person who thinks gay marriage is kind of an assimilationist thing to do necessary in the current moment, but yes, ideally, if only we could imagine a different and more radical future for everyone, a different way of ordering human society. So I would like to see this kind of openness and possibility in our translation work, which is something that I, I think I am not there yet, but I would like to be, I, I would like to be Sawako, um, which is a good thing to you know cling on to when I remember that Goodreads um, tags authors with their most starred book. Um, so I am still on Goodreads as the translator of Jackie Chan's memoir, which is always great when I look that up. Um, for all of this aside, that the key point is about what keeps us going. In this little art, Kate Briggs asks, what is it that makes this activity interesting? For the translator, what are the features of this practice of translating that invite and challenge and sustain her? And that's something I ask myself a lot, because not just sustain in the sense of making this profession sustainable, in the sense of can we make a living, can we pay our rent, but also what gives us sustenance, what makes this artistically satisfying, what will keep us going, and I think the answers to this lie in the big picture. Much as we would love to be word nerds and, and keep our noses to the grindstone and think exclusively about word choices, and I have those days as well, it's always good for my practice when I do take those steps back and go, yes, but what is the bigger picture of what I want to do? Um, and, you know, I realize that I am kind of preaching to the choir here because many of the conversations today have been along these lines. But it's absolutely not something I see in wider literary culture, the wider world. And so that's something I like to speak into being, if only to remind myself that actually this is a, a future I would like to see and make happen. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about violent phenomena um, the book of essays on translation I co-edited with Dr. Kavita Barnott. Um, and, you know, the part of me that does not want to claim my power also does not want to be all like, hey, read my book. But in this case, this is not really my book. It belongs to the 24 writers and translators featured in it. And the title, which comes from a quote by Franz Fanon as translated by Constance Farringdon, decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. 
Decolonization was something we kept in mind from the beginning. Um, in an essay that my co-editor wrote, she says, when we respond to and celebrate diversity, we don't deeply challenge a white system. We only appeal to it, try to fit ourselves into it, make ourselves attractive to it, trying to sell our diversity. Diversity boxes are ticked without really shaking things up too much. And so in a response to a call, decolonize, not diversify, we put this book together. But we didn't want to use the word decolonize in the title because there is a danger that this word, like diversity before it, will become so diluted as to be useless or meaningless, or at least not as much use as it could be. And even now, as Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Wang remind us in their essay, decolonization is not a metaphor, the term decolonization can be co-opted by focusing on the decolonizing of the mind, a formula that leads to inaction. I just want to share a few quotes from the book. Um, just to, oh, no, I pressed the wrong button. Um, they told me not to panic if that happened. Um, right, here we go. Um, so Kaima L. Glover says, failures of cultural translation create hierarchies of value, wherein lesser cultures are misread as lacking or deficient, and subsequently are deemed worthy or not of protection from harm. Just as an indication of how not thinking about translation and the choices we make within it can have potentially deadly consequences, and that there are real stakes to what we do. In his essay on translating Dalit literature, Yogesh Maitreya says, the translation of stories of the most oppressed people who have not been imagined as subjects of stories in English adds new and fresh sensibilities to a language that has hardly had them in its imagination. In her essay on translation, decolonization, and Disability rights, Kairani Baraka says, the rights of access to information is part of the set of colonial metaphors and frameworks for translation. The universal right to access information being translated is often used to mean the colonial right of people privileged by empire to access all kinds of information. I just wanted to go through these to give a quick taste of what's in the book. I could go on, but really I should just say read the book and emphasize that we brought these voices together because they represent a vision of thoughtfulness, of thinking deeply, widely, more expansively about not just what translation is, but what translation could be. We began with an Anton Her quote, so it seems only fitting to end with one. And here, from Anton's contribution to the anthology, The Mythical English Reader, which Frank has already cited today. If we want to change the way our translations are published, the way to do it is not only through individual action, but through changing the entire landscape of publishing. We need a movement to make real change in the landscape, and movements mean collective action, the sum of all our individual efforts coalescing into a single anti-colonial direction. And, and this is the invitation that I wanted to make, that we think more deeply and thought leads to action, which leads to conversation, which leads to collective action, not just amongst translators, but amongst editors and, and critics and book scouts and agents and publishers and readers, because only by thinking deeply and talking and working together will we achieve structural change. And that, I believe, is where the future of literary translation lies. Thank you. Having just extolled the value of conversation, I think we should take some questions now. Well, this is, this is not a question. It's just to say what a, what a wonderful, wonderful lecture. What a wonderful end of a, end of a day, really. Top. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. I will take that. <laughs> Thank you.
No? Okay, bonus content. I just want to say also that as someone who also writes and has had the experience of being translated, I do practice what I preach and give a huge degree of autonomy to the people who translate to me. And you kind of want to make sure you vibe with them, but also I definitely don't micromanage and I give as much freedom as I take. As a playwright, I tend to hand scripts over to directors and say, surprise me, and they do, and it's amazing. So from the other side, from the side of the author, it actually is hugely beneficial to give translators the space to be artists and to make these creative decisions. It's more rewarding all around than if you just expect some functionary who will move things from A to B like a pane of glass, like something invisible, without putting any of themselves into it. Anton. Hi. Um, thank you for the great lecture. I, I was curious that as an actor, um, from an, uh, I, I always look at like uh, actor interviews, especially like actresses, because whenever they talk about how they do their work, it always reminds me of what I'm doing. And so I'm always mm -hmm. quoting, you know, Nicole Kidman. And, and I thought, is there anything um, particularly that, um, specifically that you feel uh, informs your craft as a translator or maybe even a writer um, by, by your craft as an actor? Yeah, definitely. I, I think the sense of constraint that I feel, but not really constraint, rather constraint creating a space within which you can be creative is something I bring over from acting into translation. Like I've never really had a how far can I take this, how far can I go phase because I had that in acting. It's like, what can you do with this? Is this a valid choice? And you kind of get a sense of how far you are willing to push things, what the, the, relate, what, what the string is that connects you to the source text, whether it's a script or a book in another language. And also a lot of what I do via finding the voice has, comes from my acting background. You know, where is this narrator coming from? You do that as an actor. You kind of, before you even start looking at the script itself, or, or rather before you start rehearsing, you do all the interior work. You think, where is this person coming from? What are the given circumstances? You kind of fill in a lot of the blanks that the, the text might not give you. You create a background that is consistent with what you are given. And I bring a lot of that to my translation work. I, I do think that um, if we all um, took some acting classes, A, our translations would get better, and B, translation readings would just like be amazing. Can you imagine? <laughs> Sean. I'm feeling a little inspired by your speaking things into being. And so maybe this is a cheeky question, but I'm curious, when you think of a translation industry or a translation discipline as you would really want it to be, what do you see in your mind? I mean, look, I don't think we can disentangle translation from the apparatus of everything else that, that um, comes around it. So first I have to imagine a, a, an ideal society. Like, you know, universal healthcare, everyone's basic needs taken care of so we don't have to scrabble for money. A, a society that doesn't seek to, to commercialize all art and, and turn it into a commodity. Um, a publishing industry that isn't obsessed with numbers and, and, and debuts and all of the things that we've been complaining about all day. Um, present company completely accept, ac accepted. Um, and, and then within all of that, once you've imagined this ideal world, and then you, you're like, well, within this ideal world, what does the translation industry look like? Or it well, wouldn't be an industry at all, right? Like we have space in which we can translate um, what, what, what Julia said about if you had six months instead of three, the, the amount of time you need, the amount of support you need, editors who are on your side at all times, um, your besties with all your authors, 
like it's 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 something that we don't currently have and it's very hard to completely imagine but it's something that i like to think about small concrete things that can be done at the moment and also the bigger picture it's much easier with individual text right i can get a book and think what's the perfect circumstance in which I would like to translate this? And then sometimes I can sort of make that happen. Pre-pandemic, I could think it would be great if I was actually in Beijing to translate this book. And then I find a residency or something or just a cheap flight and a friend with a couch. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think rather than me giving you a list of, of ideal world things. It, it's more everyone having the expansiveness to dream and all translators being free to define their own working conditions and their own and to let their own creativity soar. Like that's what I'd love to see. Hi, Jeremy. Um, two things. I mean, aside from where can I get a copy of your Jackie Chan um, autobiography? Um, I wanted to thank you for this, but I also wanted to thank you and Anton and Jenny and Deborah and a bunch of people who are um, significantly younger than me um, for completely changing the way I think about what I do over the last five, seven, eight years. Um, I'm much more positive about it, partly because I think you're asking questions that perhaps should have been um, asked more loudly before. At the risk of um, going back to um, teaching editors to suck eggs, something, as you know, I'm um, <clears throat> all too keen on, do you think there's a role, and it's something I've suggested before within the context of the TA in the UK, of translators either through their agencies or uh, through whatever, communicating with young editors before they start buying uh, translations, giving them a sense of what it means to acquire books, to read a pitch, to, I mean, for most, for a lot of editors uh, on whose table or on whose desk um, um, a proposal or a pitch is going to land, they will never have acquired a book in translation before. Uh, you know, recently I was asked uh, to translate a book that someone had acquired, and I said, can you send me a copy of the book? And they said, I don't know how to do that. I don't have any contacts with the original publisher. But I think that particularly in Anglo-American publishing, there are very few editors with the skills to understand what is involved in translation. And if we don't tell them, um, then... Um, Unfortunately, we'll continue to get edits that say things like, why doesn't this happen on page three when we, you know, why don't we move this section? I mean, yes, I think there is tremendous value in that, um, which is why so many of us have these um, conversations in public, whether on platforms like this when we are given them or on Twitter where many editors also are in the hope that these conversations will seep out of the translation space into the wider literary world and a tran an editor will see them and, and perhaps begin to internalize some of these ideas. You know, that, that's why so many translators have these parasocial relationships with editors where we take them out for drinks and gush about certain translations we love and what they do that's so great in the hopes that the way translations are thought about does shift in their minds. Like, I, I think, yes, we should be having these conversations, but also it's really hard to have them directly. It can come across as didactic, um, like you know, like, like all ways in which you want to change people's minds, often you have to change the, 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 the whole system of thinking and conversation around them and hope some of it seeps in. Um, so yes, like if, if there were more structured ways of doing this, if there were more organized um, translator editor conversations, for example, like, you know, so many of the speed dating sessions that are set up by organizations like Alter are about translators pitching books to editors. It's never like editors saying to translators, so what should I know about? Um, how do I edit this translation? So maybe we could initiate some of that. I, I, I don't really know. Again, a lot of this is um, 
infrastructural change, systemic change that I don't have easy answers for, but I hope that if we spend enough time thinking together about this, we might be able to bring some of this about. Madhu. Um, I also just want to say it's always a pleasure to um, hear you talk about translation um, because what it also reminds me of is as you're doing kind of some critique and questioning and thinking about the philosophy and ideology, I always feel joy mm. when I hear you speak and I think that's something, you just mentioned the word didactic and sometimes we talk about translation like, you know, take your vitamins, like translate more work from this other culture and like get your vitamin K, Korea, you know, whatever and it's like, Actually, I think like what sometimes drops out is like I think about my own life and probably for many of us it's like, oh my god, you're you're all missing out. Like there's so much amazing work. Like if you like imagine if you never read Eastern European poetry. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you never read like, you know, Latin American, you know, fiction, right? Um and I think that sense of um joy and so the relationships that are not like pitching a book to an editor, not the parasocial, but the actual social. Mm -hmm. is something I'm interested in. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I know because you do some work in collectives, and yeah. if you can talk about those other kinds of relationships where you're just kind of like, um, what, you know, places for encouragement, but also just, you know, like where you can actually get excited with people about um, work, and you know, if you could just talk a little bit about that part of your work. Yeah, I, I mean, that is a, a piece of uh, making what we do sustainable that I didn't touch on, and that, that's the role of community. Like what we do is it can be so isolating and disheartening that, yes, having these spaces, whether they are collectives or, you know, more formal groups of people in conversation, a WhatsApp group even, just makes us feel less alone, but also is a space in which we can develop these ideas where you, you know, just that thing of you say something, someone builds on it, you, you share a book. And um, I can't remember who it was who said earlier, Anton. Anton said, the best thing to do with a sample is share it with other translators and they'll tell you what to do with it. Not, not just in a, oh, you should pitch this here or there, but also they get enthusiastic about it. And, and they maybe see things in it you didn't, or they make you view it in a slightly different way. Like just, just being less alone, I think is good. Not just in a, we need, we're social beings, we need community kind of way, but also because no one's thoughts are sufficient. We always think better in the company of others by exchanging thoughts with others. Um, and, and yes, I, I, I want to echo um, what you said, Matthew, about joy. Like we're allowed to have fun. And, and I think we should own that more. So often it, translation is seen as this rather door, um, or we're doing this for the good of, of um, cultural exchange or whatever. And actually we do this, at least in part, because we're having a blast. And I think it's good to remind ourselves of that because we're not in this for the money or our health. In yeah. fact, the opposite. And we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't in some way fun. Or I wouldn't. But yes, talk to another translator. And I can't remember who it was. One of the critics at the start of the day said tweet more in a slightly different context. So I would want to echo that. Keep tweeting. Um, yeah, the, the, thank you again for, you know, um, the very inspiring talk and a lot of possibilities are opened up there. Um, wanted to mention just a, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I totally agree with your, um, I totally agree with how you brought up this idea of, um, as I understood also, colonialism itself as a kind of translation project that we have to uh, contend with, especially a translation project that aims to make cultures, create shortcuts, you know, uh, to governance, make cultures visible, uh, legible uh, very easily. And, and what you proposed is, you know, a, a different, kind of approach which uh, which is which um, premises the kind of the artistic nature of, of translation which sometimes may make it less reliable as as a as a colonial as an object of colonial governance right uh, 
but uh, but I, I think that it, what happens is that this, I found in my case, like for instance, I've been working with Valmiki's Ramayana, and, and I find that this makes a certain kind of uh, Western audience very uncomfortable because suddenly I've become unreliable, you know, in the sense that I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing things which kind of, uh, sometimes may make, may make things opaque as opposed to just transparent, right? Um, so, the, I mean, the, the question I wanted to ask is that if, if we move towards what you're proposing, right, um, is there, can we also think about um, different ways of reading a translation, for instance, that to, to move it just away from just the translator themselves to the reader, um, like I, for instance, lately founding my, find myself like, that moment where I can see the presence of the translator in a text, and suddenly I start hearing it in stereo, right? That there's, mm -hmm. there's two voices there, and, I, and it is possible to, to hold those two voices in my head as I read. So that, that was, and, and the last thing is, I mean, I guess it's related to all of this is that, you know, I was, I think, listening to a talk by Esther Allen, who's talking about this translation man manifesto from the 1960s which is all the things we're saying now. So, so in the sense that I, I feel also a little frustrated because it, when you really look at it, it looks like we keep having the same conversation every few decades. But in terms of the, the general perception of what translation is in society, that doesn't seem to shift at all. It doesn't seem to uh, change. So, so, so that, that, that's, you know, how can we kind of, uh, move the conversation forward and also I'm curious to know you know how you read translations and how, how we could find innovate, innovative ways of reading translations um, thank you that that's a really rich question with a, with a lot to dig into um, I, I want to begin by saying that my absolute favorite thing to do is to make Western audiences feel uncomfortable um, so good um, and as for how we read translations, differently in a more productive, artistically satisfying, open way. Um, that's something that we need to discover together, I think. And probably um, we part of this is how criticism of translations takes place. You know, so much of it still focuses on metrics like fluidity or accuracy which we know are the least interesting ways to look at a translation. Like the, the stereotype of the translator getting palmed off with one adjective, sort of adverb in, in the review, right? Like pleasantly translated or muscu translated with muscularity or whatever. Like that, that, that's a stereotype because it so often happens because critics don't know what to say about the translation. They have, thanks to Twitter, internalized the idea that they have to acknowledge the presence of the translator in some way, but then they don't really have a way of engaging with it so often. And so you just get the one adjective. Um, and I, I don't know, we, we need to read more thoughtfully together. Maybe we need to talk more about books in public. There aren't enough panels of translators talking about other people's translations. I think that could be quite productive. Um, there aren't really enough reviews written by translators of translations, and I'd love to see more of that. Um, I think more public conversations where, yes, we don't just talk about how we translate, but how we read translations, or just we talk about translations and then we will start to look at them differently. This has to be a whole apparatus, I, th I think. Um, I, I know I keep answering this to every question, but it, it's systemic change. It's got to be in the big picture and, and we can just do what we can in our own capacity. But the more we talk about this and try to work collectively, the more likely these changes are going to happen. And then hopefully we won't have to have this conversation again in 30 years. One hopes. Although if we do, I'll, I'll like, you know, be here in 30 years. <laughs> banging the same drum. Okay, is that it? Are we 
ending. So see you in 30 years to say the same things again. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>